What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Food Origins Podcast. Today, my guest is Eduardo Garcia of Montana Mex. He's a chef, educator, storyteller, and I like to call him a food ambassador. Um, we sat down on location in Montana. I found out about Eduardo about five years ago. So this podcast is five years in the making. I watched Yeti films, Hungry Life series, saw Eduardo cooking with Chef Ranga. Um, was just, it was just awesome to see that, uh, just cooking outdoors with your friends. And then I saw his documentary, Charged. If you have not watched his documentary, Charged, you need to go check it out. Um, Eduardo has an incredible journey of resilience and just, just you know being able to push through all that um and then create an amazing company with his family and has an amazing journey so uh, he is nominated for an emmy congrats to you eduardo for his show big sky kitchen and he's also a double nominated and winner he already won a james beard award win award for Big Sky Kitchen on Magnolia Network. So congrats, Eduardo, on that. And look forward to seeing you on the Emmys. And he's also working on a cookbook as well. And we connected over social through his company, Montana Mex. They make a series of seasonings and sauces. And he does a cooking, live cooking series, virtual series, and um, been cooking with them for the last few years. And so shout out to Montana Max and the team for putting us together and really enjoy all the different uh, cooking classes that we've taken. And if you are interested, just go to montanamax.com and you'll check out all their, all their products. And then you'll see the next upcoming class is coming up very soon. As soon as this podcast releases, you'll have maybe two days to, to get in on shipping for your kit, which is great. So you get a chef kit that kind of helps you, guide you through the process of making the recipe for that, for that class. Um, had a great conversation with Eduardo. We sat down, talked about our family and our impact from them with our cooking and food in general, and then got into some of his mindset on how food gets created. And so his process and, and what he's thinking about and talking about industry and, and, and all our friends and products and stuff like that. So thank you, Eduardo. Um, appreciate you and appreciate everyone at Montana Mix and everyone listening to the podcast. Enjoy this episode. Enjoy. Yeah, I honored to be here in Montana on location with Eduardo Garcia. Uh, sure. And, uh, you know, so many things I can in in your bio that I can go over. But, you know, chef, founder of his own company, uh, athlete, food, you know, um, f what do you want to say? Food ambassador, I would say, you know, I hunter, like, like fisherman. And many, many, many other things that we'll get into today. So thanks for being on the Food Origins podcast. Um, My pleasure. Appreciate you. Appreciate the team, Montana Mex team out there, Lindsay, Indra, Isabel. Appreciate you guys. So thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Dave. Happy to be here with you and with all of you. Um, we met through Montana Mex. So I like thanks for the shout out to the team. Without, yeah, without for sure. That team, you know, do I need to speak right into this? Is that uh, how? Just give it a couple inches in front of you. Okay. You're good. There we go. Yep. I'll try not to bounce around. Yeah. And that's, you know, the connection over basically the internet is kind of wild that we're sitting here today for me, you know, and, mm. and meeting and then working with some of your products, started cooking with them and then playing around with them. And then, you know, Eduardo was doing, um, virtual cooking classes so they started doing those you know you did, we recently was the last one was the tamale class yeah tamalada in december yeah so that was great um and then that kind of like gives you know and what 
you've been doing too is just educating people with food for pretty much the whole time but like uh just getting that experience and then you know then that's how you know we all got connected with all that stuff yeah before so. it said food origins it said I, was that your original social handle? No, no, so it was the Victual Hub. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And I was like, who is this Victual Hub that yeah. tags us all the time and is now putting out? What I noticed is it went from, you know, we're a small company, Montana Mex, and, yeah. um, you know, from its founding origins of four of us to the the dip of a couple of us keeping it going prior to COVID to. A handful of us now have been here for, I mean, Isabel's been here. She's coming in on year five, just just eclipsed it actually. And and others, two, three, four, five years, you know. And so we've, it's a small team of four or five of us. And um, all of a sudden, the Victual Hub, you know, always on Montana Max. And just like, we met you, I think, when you were still at that handle. Yeah. And then yes. after we had a cooking session together, um, a proposed Mother's Day hang. Then I started to see this food origins. Your same name though, Dave Sands. It's like, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. Anyway, so here we are, and it's been neat to see your journey too. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. And you know, um, give us your kind of bio. Introduce yourself. Uh, I like to get everyone. You know, tell us your background. Tell us your in ethnicity. Mm. What you're made of. Where you're from. Born and raised. All that good stuff. Nice. I, uh, keep me on track and pull me back in because, fair disclaimer, I, I do a horrible job with bios. So I'll just go down this tangent and it'll all be cultural. Yeah. And then someone will say, oh, you missed out. You're an executive producer and you're also, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the business. Okay, so yeah. professional. Um, I'm a curious individual. You know, I mean, Eduardo Garcia, been bouncing around, picking up rocks and looking at opportunity zones since I was a little kid. Uh started working in food professionally for pay at 15 and uh, rode that through education post high school. Got a degree in the culinary arts, not really knowing exactly where that would take me or what it would do other than knowing it had served me during those high school years. It gave me a really sharp focus to put my energy towards and, you know, 42 now. So quite a migration of just general time, a couple decades. And I've worked as a private chef in that time, traveling the world on yachts. Um, from there, migrated to business owner, founder, working in the consumer packaged goods space, selling products that my company Montana Max makes, both in grocery, direct to consumer online, and, and now also work as an executive producer, storyteller, and I think you said it best probably is um, food ambassador. I like that. I mean, it's, it's to, to stand for something, to share a snapshot, to be an ambassador for, whether it's a program or an initiative or a culture or a product. And um, it's been such a journey just to even learn more about myself and how I am. So to have you reference me as an ambassador for my own business or yeah. brand, yeah, it's quite a migration for a Jewish Mexican kid growing up in Southwest Montana to have, have someone reflect that back. Like, you know, you've made it your business to be yourself. Yeah. Anyhow, so that's a snapshot yeah. on me, I guess. Yeah, and there's one uh, like m a little more that, that I'd like to tell everyone is like I think you're a example of re being resilient as well. Mm, You've gone through you. a lot, so if you have not seen, you know, that's another thing was like I think my intro to you was maybe a Yeti film like about the hungry life about mm -hmm. five years ago or so. Mm -hmm. Saw you cooking. I think it was Chef Ranga, mm -hmm. right, your buddy. Yeah. So you guys were just going out, hanging out, cooking, yeah. fishing. That's like, you know, that's chef's dream right there. It's just hanging out, finding fresh food, cooking it, hanging out together. Right? Yeah. Like that's, that's awesome. But you know, you went through a lot of other things. So if you haven't seen his documentary charged, mm. you know, Eduardo went through an accident in the woods and that put him through quite a, a journey from there. And we don't have to dive into it too much, but you know, that's, that's part of, you know, who you are and that's part of mm. giving you, you know, an example that gave, showed me an example of resilience. Like this guy went mm. through 
uh, you know, an accident that caused you to get burned and then you had health issues and the things that, that progress and you're like, no, I'm still pushing on. I still, despite everything that happened and cause you've done you you know, you found your company later after all that. Right. 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 right at the same time. Right at the same no, time. I, yeah. came, I came back from yachting at 30 mm-hmm. in the springtime. Yeah. April. And our company, we had actually incorporated our company the year before, opened a bank account, had rented a kitchen, and where I was working on recipes while I was on the yacht in 2009, 2010. And my sister was running the recipe out of a small kitchen in Livingston and where we started selling farmer's markets just summertime only. We had picked up one local account, Town Country Foods, and so she would bring her kids with her. They'd sleep on a cot. She'd cook salsa, deliver it. I mean, that that was the company, right? Yeah. You know, and yeah. um, myself and Jen, one of our partners at the time, it would design it from a computer, but she, Jen would be in Britain, or I'd be on the yacht, right? I mean, I was taking our salsa prototypes, our jars, our cans, or our containers. If I'd be in Italy, because I'd be working, but I'd still, like, bring the salsa out, and yeah. like, Pompeii behind us, or, you know, and... Uh, it was is an is interesting start start starting the company like that and then coming home to give it a full send along with launching a television show about cooking in the outdoors as a kind of dual approach to marketing messaging brand building and product distribution and growth and sales and uh, and that sounds very technical and sort of just you know flatline business talk but if you eat food, yeah. you are connected to a distribution chain with someone talking like me, thinking like me, and somehow capitalizing either on your need for food or on your interest of food. And so at some point, chefing brought me to a very sincere reality that cooking for others is an elemental need. It's a must do if you're going to live. And yet I was on the flip side of it. I was working in excess, working in luxury, no financial budgets whatsoever to really work within. And, um, and so when you can buy and cook anything, you're not limited by anything other than what you want to put into it. Perhaps it removes one of the veils or pulls the curtain even further back, you know, like those old school stages where there's 20 different backdrops that you could drop down, drop down the mountain backdrop and like the big curtain would come down. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden working without financial (laughs) limit, curtain drops. Like, okay, well, I don't got to worry about money anymore. That's great. I can cook anything anymore. And so then you just, you you start paying attention to, well, what do people want to eat every day in a different way? Because you're not so bound by what can I work with to then go cook. Yeah. How much money do I have? Okay, I don't have to make it work just on this $5. Or, and so it just brought me to a whole different side of the food equation. And so when we started our company, the company was never really bound by, we're going to go make a bunch of money because that was never really part of my fundamental food story. It was rather how do we make a product that resonates and has a definite sort of attributable effect on you with you, for you, yeah. you're going to buy it. Yeah. Doesn't, I mean, gosh, to, to just purchase an experience that kind of flows in and out of you. Yeah. Yeah. So short lived, yep. you know, there's not someone, there's not no, there's no one listening, very few listening. I would think that are eating with a general of, okay, $5 and it's going to equate to this many like kilowatts of energy in my body. And like, no one yeah. don't do that. No, no, we eat based on all of these qualitative markers of se- like sensory well beyond how you, you know, recipes described yeah. time goes so well with Gruyere cheese and the crisp of this, that's benign compared to how your body communicates with all that food. And that's what I started to see working and living with people every day mm. with no limit other yeah. than to observe. It's like, wow, yeah. okay, I'm seeing how this affects and I could feed you truffles all day and I recognize it's not having the same effect it did. First time the I first served, time. Yeah, first time yeah. I served you truffle fries during the summer, I watch you and all your guests so, Wow, it was delicious, you know. And then by the twentieth time, September, end of yeah. summer, yeah, eh, it's like, what's on the menu, chef? Oh, truffle fries and great. Mmm. Okay. Yeah. There's more than just consumption, mm-hmm. right? So, anyhow, that the founding principles of our company was we wanted to um, almost use products as a Trojan horse for the evocative feelings of 
connecting with yeah. others through food. And so how how is one person going to connect with multiple many at scale? You know, yeah. having a food show and having a food product is a pretty decent equation for distribution. Yeah. And we'll get into like more like talking about food equity and, you know, there's a lot. Of, yeah, sorry, that was a tangent. No, it's great. And then I'll, I'll just bring you back. And one of the things I like to get back to is your early days with food is what do you eat growing up? Oh, yeah. Um, single parent home, mom. We lived on, you know, start. I don't recall exactly what I ate younger than six other than I got, fo- I love oatmeal and I got photos of me with oats on my head. So I ate oats. <laughs> Mom would make us wheatgrass shots and carrot shot, carrot juice shots. Mom was very, you know, she was part of the original organic movement in Southern California in the 80s. And so when we moved to Montana, we, our community and the church we were in had an organic farm. So a lot of our greens came from the farm. I mean, they, they had big vats that they were making miso. You know, it, it was all macrobiotic, whole food cookery. You know, I going to public school for the first time in my early 10, 11, 12, it was 12, uh, and seeing other kids with soda for the first time and um, like cheese whiz or whatever that is and American cheese. I don't, you know, yeah. it was, I was that kid with the soy sauce, like soy cheese, sourdough, grilled cheese. Well, that kid had the white bread, American cheese, grilled cheese. What I can tell you was at first order, that one was a lot tastier. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to trade for my soggy sourdough, like action with the tomato slice in it. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. (laughs) So, but, but I credit mom now. I almost made disclaimer, Dave's van camping and and stay. We had breakfast this morning. Yeah. And so I almost made us miso soup because that's a classic breakfast for me is miso Mm, mm. uh, once a week, you know, here in home. So, yeah, so mom raised us on whole foods and local foods and no processed sugars, no processed foods whatsoever. So... And thank you for breakfast, by the way. Amazing, amazing breakfast. Elk, some wild rice, gravy, delicious. Um, Yeah, and, you know, then and then that kind of... Was there anything you didn't like, you know... Um, just like palate wise. I mean, that's mm. a really nice experience, like having that, that branch of, or, you know, yeah. a lot of stuff out there before any of the like process stuff kind of came into play. Is there, you know, having that open palate that, that was pretty good, right? You didn't have anything that you were like, Ooh, it's not for me. Not that I remember. Um, you know, my brother was born with allergies towards, seafood and maybe dairy or wheat early on. And Mm -hmm. so we were just a conscious home out of the gate for everyone's health. And um, I I remember a specific moment for sure where there was always steamed kale or steamed broccoli or some pile of greens in our our, salad. And I, I do remember, I have a conscious moment of knowing that I was confronted with a pile of vegetables at one point in time as a youngster. I feel like this is after I was six though. So I was in Montana and it was sort of the plate and me and you had to eat it all. And I just remember not liking the veggies as much as I liked whatever was next to them. And yet the funny thing, it was probably like teriyaki tofu or something, right? Yeah. We're really raised on a lot of meat. um, And I think in that moment, I just have a very clear memory of not what I was wearing, not what side of the table I was sitting on. I just know I was looking at a plate of veggies and I thought, well, I'm going to just eat all that first then. Hmm. As I just like made a conscious change and forever, ever and ever and always now, I just get after the greens and veg all the time. I love it. So, you know, I I do look back and I think for nine out of 10 times I meet someone as a chef or a private chef and outside of pure dietary cannot or do not eat, those proclivities towards this flavor, that taste, ooh, I don't eat that or I'm not really like really interested in that. A lot of it goes back to that childhood experience. You know, what what did you eat as a kid? Yeah, that's why I ask it. Yeah. <laughs> and then is, you know, is there somewhere along the lines that uh, a dish or maybe something with, with the impact of food that you're like, oh, I want to keep making this. Like, oh, I had this meal and I'm like, oh, I want to learn how to make this. And, you know, I guess you, a chef is what you have to, le- you know, learn to be, you go to culinary school or, or work in a restaurant and learn how to make that dish. What's, what's at some mm. point that kind of sent you on that track? 
you know. I'll go back to um, it. Takes it goes back to my mom still. Yeah. Uh, I bought the Joy of Cooking cookbook, classic, been around in many editions. Yeah. I bought that at 20, 19, 20. So I graduated cooking school. I was on my first yacht. I have one of five crew, had the potential to sleep 10 guests. So at any point in time, there could be 15 people. And I'm young. Uh, like I'd been flipping burgers and cooking in restaurants for six years at that point, gone to cooking school. And yet, I remember someone wanting mac and cheese. It was probably the crew for a barbecue or I don't, doesn't even matter. Yeah. They wanted macaroni and cheese. And I, I wasn't raised to eat macaroni and cheese. Yeah. So I had to look it up. Yeah. It's like, I need an all American book. So I bought the joy of cooking, mm. bought the joy of cooking, mac and cheese. Great thing about joy of cooking, which is tremendous. I don't know how everyone considers mac and cheese, but my guess <laughs> is that it's sort of on that lower entry level meal plan where a lot of the weight sits in our diet and you know not everyone having a, a filet mignon you know tenderloin right. yeah very expensive mac and cheese i just feel like it's sort of one of those commoditized classified dishes now yeah. right on the everyone, bottom, bottom rung of the ladder everyone yeah. has their version of it in pallets and boxes and multiples right yeah. tv dinners you name it mac and cheese and yet at its baseline it's pasta which is actually quite fascinating, you know, to take a grain and emulsify it and grind it and bind it and then boil it and have it expand and steam and shoot. I mean, that's a complex carbohydrate when you really think about it. Yeah. And so then you go from that to the rest of the equation and it's a bechamel sauce. So that's French classic. So even if you remove that terminology, it's potential dairy twice unless you go with a stock instead of milk. But you're making... You know, you're making a sauce thickened with a roux. Yeah. Then you're melting cheese. It, 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 that's if you start with mac and cheese from the joy of cooking. If you look at a box of craft, you just think mac and cheese is pasta and powder. Yeah. And water. milk or water, yeah. right? And so it's, I just remember fundamentally connecting my culinary school education to a recipe in a book that was connected to such classic everyday, like Americana fare. And when I looked at its elemental components, I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is a complex sauce. And if you're going to make that macaroni from scratch, I mean, gosh, this would be a labor of love, you know? Yeah. And so I don't know, you know, I think I, I've come to learn about foods through experiencing other people's desires for foods, but always going back to my radical, like always going back to, well, like, I'll figure out how to cook it so you like it for your memory. Yeah. But if I'm going to keep doing it, it's because I'm super drawn by it's like generation point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have some dishes that are always right here that you're like, Oh, that it's time to make that dish again. Yeah. Impulsively for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, black beans, you know, uh, my dad would always ask what I wanted to eat when I came home from the yacht and I came home twice a year, spring and fall. And I would just say frijoles, you know, make me your beans because I mean, that meant that there would be a stack of tortillas. That meant that there'd be some fresh jalapeno. And whether it was venison or trout or just eggs, scrambled eggs, but dad's beans, tortillas, jalapeno, that combo with anything. Yeah. you know. And so I make that now, and it's pretty evocative of him and brings me tremendous joy. Yeah, it's just a st like that's the base, and then everything else just kind of gathers around it make a pot of beans on sunday express it in salads and you know fry up breakfast and by friday that last cup sitting in your tupperware or in the pot blend it up you know now it goes a drizzle sauce on a quesadilla or whatever you know like mm -hmm. um yeah it's i think sing, simple pot single pot cookery making big batches uh, again i don't live uh, i think folks probably wonder how you eat as a chef or you know what's yeah. And people ask my wife, Becca, what's it like living with a chef? And, you know, I'll, I'll wake up with a pension to cook something, but it's not every day. You know, yeah. so much of my cookery happens in here and happens in here well before it manifests out into breakfast or something. Yeah. And that's something we were just getting into. You know, I was like, well, let's save that for the podcast is your thoughts, mm. you know, thoughts on food because you're like this. It becomes it's it's a thought first before you even you can go look for ingredients, buy ingredients, put them together, prep them, cook them, share them, 
Yeah. Right. So like, you know, tell us about that mind, that mindset with the, the thoughts on food, what goes, you know, it's, there's a lot going on. Jekyll and Hyde on the one hand, when it's, when that's the target, I'll eat what's in front of me. I'll eat what's in front of me. Yeah. Other times I'll make a point of not eating because I just want to, I'm going to get home because I know I have this, that, and this and that, and that's what I'm hungry for. Yeah. You know, I'll find myself looking at an easy over the counter fast option and sometimes I go for it. I'll crush a gas station hot dog. Don't get me wrong. You know? (laughs) Yeah. And, but I dream about I'm eating it and I'm like, man, I'd love to get my wand behind this and snap that bun with some integrity. Same to the hot dogs, same to the ketchup, same to the mayonnaise. Yeah. That's not necessarily how our world food world works. You know, having manufactured food products, that's how we met. What an interesting departure to go from making a sauce from whole materials by yourself, beginning to end, and then to take that recipe, say it produces a gallon of sauce, and then to go to an industrial co-packer and work on a 100-gallon recipe or a 1,000-gallon recipe (laughs) and realize that our vinegars are diluted, potentially, Mm. using super industrial strength vinegar so it's like a time 10 dilution right or you know so it's like okay where we would have used a cup of vinegar in my recipe now we're using a tablespoon because this is super potent Mm. and 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 then of course packaging you know are we going to preserve color are we going to preserve flavor are we going to how do we package this so that it can be distributed and uh and so my thought process really swims from the gamut I walked into the greenhouse and I pulled bok choy leaves out for breakfast, steamed them simple. There's not much left to it. That was it. And if you got a square foot of light coming through a window somewhere on your apartment or condo or wherever you are, or you're in a, you have plenty of land, you know, so the growing a plant, picking the green, that's more how I cook right now. Not in the literal But that's how my mind works is how can all of the actions leading up to the bite be part of my bite? Yeah. So it's, uh, it can be fairly chaotic. You know, I find myself, like I said, I won't eat for six hours because I'm just like, I'm not attracted to eating yet. Mm. I know there's X, Y, and Z at home or I'm headed to a friend's who's going to have a pot of food on or, and so more and more, I'm just, I'm pretty thoughtful just for, that's my interest, right? Like that's where my interest is. Yeah. I'm sure and I know I've been there, but I'm sure, you know, there's times where we collectively will go through and our interest is elsewhere. And you, you'll go days, weeks, months probably without really investing in what you're eating. You just sort of like... This, Ebb and flow. I yeah. do sandwiches at lunch. Yeah. You know, I do this at dinner. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's more of my process now is just... If, you tend, if you've ever been burnt out on something and you have a sincere love for that thing... More often than not, you're going to have to walk away. And more often than not, I'd say you're not going to come back to that attraction point through the same way you did the last time. Yeah. You're going to try and figure out how do I come back to this in a way that's maybe new, fresh, regenerative, whatever. And so that's kind of my journey with food and my thoughts with food is I I sort of try to let it be like water, run through me, stay with me, keep me alive, keep me afloat, and not force the equation. I'm writing about food right now and I realize I'm finding so little words to talk about flavors and tastes and textures. My interest has so much more to do with all of the other parts of that ingredients journey to become bread or pasta or mac and cheese. What kind of cow? What was it eating? Huh? Sandy soil, rocky soil. Huh? And I think after I'm 42, so I haven't had a long life, but after the life I've had, being in so much direct connection with the thing, the, the, the food item going directly in my mouth, whatever it's the water out of the tap, the green out of the garden, the apple off the tree, the animal off the hill, the fish out of the water, at some point it's irrefutable that I'm having this conscious experience of what that animal is like that plant is like and I think it has to do with my connection to it in its living form versus when you're just given a meal you have to sell the attribute of flavor 
Right. You don't know the story of it. Yeah. The attachment. Yeah. So the, yeah. So my taste for food has everything to do with the story and relationship of how that became food. The taste is almost just simply like part of the experience at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot more people are getting back to that too, because they're realizing like, oh, where did that come from? Where did that steak come from? That's showed up in a package and styrofoam and in plastic, you know. And now people are like, oh, you know what? There's, you know, and I've talked to regenerative farmers or or I've gotten meat from a certain farm because someone was like, hey, these guys do grass-fed barley finished up in Idaho. And I'm like, it tastes amazing. And that's all they do. That's the only thing they do. He was a techie right. guy, took over a farm. Shout out to Crosso Meats. Uh, you know, they took over and they're like, this is what we do. We want to make good cattle. Uh, the land was almost going to get taken over. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, let's take our land back and produce good meat. And, you know, and you find those things and then someone gets to taste it and they're like, well, how, how come this tastes different mm -hmm. than what I got at the store? And I'm like, well, it, it took effort to get it there. Yeah. But also like, if you looked at where you were getting stuff, um, and I think that's, that's, we've kind of been, I, I think we've been tricked into it a little bit because I told my dad, I told, uh, Greg the other day, the guy I was talking to the other day, I was like, my dad's m milk that he got when he was a kid is not the milk we get today. Mm. And I'm like, what happened to that? You know, um, why isn't it the same thing when in a glass bottle fresh from the, the dairy farmer, it's like all these different processes, you know, and you were talking about scale and having to mass produce stuff. But for a while we were just, we would just get what we have. Like not everyone has avocado every day. You know, no. avocados were not a regular thing. Yeah. You couldn't make walk every single day. It was just <laughs> in season. Like, if, you know, and, and people are starting to realize yeah. like, the, you know, the farmer's market, I think is a great example of going there and seeing what's available and that's yeah what you work with. And I think sh chefs enjoy that because, okay, give us a grocery bag, like, and say, make whatever's in there because this is all we have. You yeah. Know? It, it's, it's a more natural way of doing it. Yeah. What, what is, what is uh, most immediately available and I think there's also an equation of um, very few of us outside of looking at a nutritional label on the back of a product that's packaged. You won't see a nutritional label on the zucchini. So we, we only have our snippets of learning of why vegetables or starches or, you know, I think that it's sort of like just a, a, a soup of information. And... Um, yeah, I think that I, I've never really met anybody that wasn't somehow be percolated after being in closer proximity to the food or water they're imbibing and taken on. I just, I've seen only what I've seen in 42 years, but I've never seen anyone go the other way. Yeah, 100%. So, yeah. It's a sincere attraction. It's um, pretty obvious to me when you look at the most where 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 publicized cooked for you food gets the most attention is in hospitality it seems restaurants and the majority a lot of those restaurants and those chefs and those spaces are pinnacled in this like a devotion to making the most of a few ingredients, right? Like celebrating from this ramp was picked yesterday and it's only available now. If you have ramps in November, well, maybe it's because, you know, you're on the other side of the hemisphere and so it is your spring or something like that. Right. Or that ramp was dried and powdered and now it's a dust or it was pickled and now it's in your Bloody Mary. Or, and so like preservation is not necessarily new at all preservation is not new at all and so I, I just think it's pretty exciting to see covid gave sourdough this brand new facelift <laughs> yeah you know what i'm saying for sure and i'm i'm over here cheering it on too yeah it, you, you yeah. know it encouraged me to get baking again yeah and um i baked a loaf of bread the other day i'm not necessarily going to say it turned out great but i'm also it, I ate it. It was tangy. It was sour. 
way sour than I thought it was going to be, mm. or maybe some too yeah. sour. Yeah. And I think part of my taste for food right now has more to do with why did I even make this bread? You know, less expectation on how it'll turn out. Rather, I'm tasting, like I have a strong appetite for that process just to see what happens. I want to mill this flour myself. I'm going to grind it up. There's a whole wheat, whole bran, whole, whole grain experience. Cool. It didn't rise. It wasn't super lofty. It wasn't sweet. All right. Yeah. Well, I didn't add milk to it and I didn't add honey to it. And well, no doubt, you know? Yeah. So it's, uh, I don't know. It's, um, I had, I worked for a guy, I I worked for a, um, I worked for an owner of a yacht and he made the point to say, Eduardo, it's not that you're the best chef in the world. There's plenty of other chefs that cook circles around you. He didn't say it like that, but that was, this point was what you have is a absolute care and interest in what you do and who you do it for that's unsurpassed. And I've really come to love that attraction I have and how it comes across to those that I work with less attached to, is this going to taste better? How, how am I going to make you anything better than you've been? I mean, that's such a, a bit abysmal way of thinking. Hmm. I'm going to make you something better than you've ever, ever oh. had. Yeah. But, that's a, that's a, that's a never going to fill bucket. Yeah. However, if I flip it and say, I have one meal to connect with you on, I'm just going to make this absolutely what I'm drawn by and into sort of, it's sort of successful moving before it's across the line. Yeah. As long as I've made sure to do my reciprocal note. And I learned this as a chef years ago, as a young chef that I really became less passionate about making my agenda yeah. But rather be like, well, Dave, what do you eat or what don't you eat? Okay, none of this, lots of that. Kind of like exploring this because of my joints or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Sweet, you know, some may see a restriction, but you can also just put a boundary around that and say, all right, in here now is where we play. Yeah. Anywhere in here. Yeah. Because he said so. Yeah. You know, and I think that's that's pretty fun too. Yeah, and I, I think I, it's, it's in all of the things you do. Like you, you play with it. And you provide like, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you haven't seen Eduardo's show, Big Sky Kitchen, it's like you provide an experience, you know, and some of the the shows you have people coming over. So you're like, okay, pe- certain people are coming over, you know, we're going to do, you know, I think you made a Reuben, a crispy mm-hmm. Reuben. I mean, you know, and at, at the end... Or there's like a, where, wherever it was in the process, you're just eating it yourself <laughs> on camera. Yeah. And you're just like, you know, this is, this is the bite I've been waiting for, you know, yeah. and the, all that process. And, you know, that I think chefs enjoy that part too. Yeah. Because usually chefs eat last <laughs> for the most part, right? We, you know, the food goes out, we'll eat whenever. Mm-hmm. But to get that bite and go, okay, yeah, I'm happy. It makes, you know, you start dancing, you know, you're yeah. talking about like a moving. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause you know, it's going to be good when your family's getting it or, you know what I mean? Like that's the fun part Yeah. too, is that like you can taste, you taste the sauce or you taste the dish finished and you're like, yeah, that's it. It's in there. It's, it's, it's the love's in there, the, the salt's in there. <laughs> and then you, you, you let it go and then you just watch it. You just watch it, watch them taste it. And you're like, they're like, dang. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what's in here and i'm like well <laughs> love mm-hmm. love's in there and and a whole bunch of good ingredients yeah put together in the way i like i want you to have it yeah and you do that a lot you do that in many many different ways you know whether it's hunting fishing cooking for a mass amount of people um thank you, you. know you've had it in, in a vast way and i think some of the things you were talking about you had an event yesterday mm-hmm. with 600 high schoolers right yeah yeah. Tell us about that and then tell us about your 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 mindset coming after that and talking about, you know, equity with food. Sure. Um, uh, our, our local community college has a culinary program. And last year was my first year in contact with that school. Um, my company, Montana Mex, not only do we make products for the grocery category and direct-to-consumer, but I consider us more educators in our core, what we like to do is to even in that education of um, when we came to the market with our barbecue sauce without corn syrup in it and our ketchup, we weren't the first on the market. 
but we were a small percentage collectively of the market that was making sauces for distribution without corn syrup. So even in that sense, I see marketing, I'm like, wait a minute, it's educating. I'm not trying to force you to buy anything. I want you to make sure how can I communicate with the most sincere sincerity. This is why I made it and this is what it is, right? Yeah. And so given the opportunity to work with the community college and starting to host a Latino history cooking class once a year, open my eyes more to where we can become educators outside of category in grocery. And so trying to put myself back in those educational settings, a group called FCCLA national program, they umbrella. And so they bring in an organization called pro start, which is founded by the national restaurant association and pro start under sort of, and with that partnership of FCCLA, they will do annual conferences, competitions. So where FCCLA is focused on youth leadership and home sciences and um, community entrepreneurship, really. Um, ProStart finds its home science within that same leadership bubble. And so yesterday I judged teamwork, organization, skills, and performance while other judges and chefs from here, from local restaurants, were there judging entree for taste, dessert for taste, baking for competition. And we're watching all these high schoolers, one hour, knocking out three dishes, teams of four. They've got the space this big to work in where we are. They're cooking over a single little Bunsen burner, maybe baking on those burners with makeshift boxes. I mean, it's so impressive. Yeah, It was so impressive, you know, and ultimately I'm watching these students going after their own negotiated terms. They're showing up. It's a student run organization. Yeah. And so I, it, my role really, I think is to fan their fire in that position. And so being able to then speak with them at the end of the day, chef coat off, handing out awards. And uh, I did a presentation earlier called, um, cooking as a recipe for life. So I did an hour long during the day, maybe 80 students fact, f- like filtered in. Yeah. And I thought I was losing them. I saw this one sleeping. I saw that one sleeping, <laughs> you know, oh man, you know, and if they're high school students, some of them want to be here. And then after it ends, and I'm just sharing my story. Like here's what buying lobster in the Caribbean taught me. Here's what cooking in rough weather taught me. Here's what losing my left hand taught me. And it's not prophetic, trying to sort of be up on a podium, even though that's the physical reality. I'm on a stage in front of everybody. Yeah. I'm simply just trying to fan their fire and just say, you know, I was in similar scenarios to all of you, but we all have our own journey. And so when you lose your left hand, which I hope none of you lose your left hand, but when you stub your toe in life, here's what I learned from that moment. When you want to switch careers and go from this to that, because I did that, here's what I learned. And so... More than anything, um, the feedback keeps me there, keeps me saying yes to these opportunities. I'll get one student maybe, maybe to be 100, but even if it's just one saying, I heard you, thank you. And what was cool about this year, it was my second year volunteering and going to the conference, is I had students that met me the year before and they're still in the program. And so I'm watching for their second year Uh, hustle. Nice. And all of a sudden I'm seeing them win awards that, Total, you know, like add up to huge scholarships, thousands of dollars of scholarships, especially if they win a national conference, you know, culinary tournament. And I paid my own way through school, $33,000 of loans and hard work to pay it all off. If someone would have handed me a $10,000 check to go to school and get educated, you know, so I feel like I'm salt in their dish. I'm just a small percentage of what they got cooking. And yet, you know, when you don't have salt in the dish. And so like they have all the cards already. They just need to be like catalyzed and or just saying or, or nothing. They're going. Yeah. They got their own salt. Yeah. And I just get to say, tastes good. Keep it up. Yeah. Go right alongside them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how, how can I roll this? How can I open this door? You're going to do the 110 hour day. You are going to be the one that drops the mm-hmm. stock pot. You yeah. are going to have the business that fails. You'll flip, you know, bankruptcy. Like, I've yeah. been there, done that. Yeah. And haven't done it all. I'm only 42. So I, I just, I love that reciprocal, that cascade of education that comes with a dose of humility plus a lot of interest and curiosity. 
generationally it's there. You know, I, elders have so much to teach us and I recognize, I still feel like a kid, but I'm 42. I'm looking at a 16 year old student crushing an event. They maybe have a kid at home. I don't know. Yeah. It's truly. Yeah. I had kid. I had friends at 15, you know, mm-hmm. became parents. And so I just see so much, I feel so much humility. It helps me almost drop my stress to go and look at these young individuals and be like, wow, go, go. Yeah. So it's pretty rad. That's awesome. That's super awesome. And, you know, respect for your time getting close, but we're, we're still good. Uh, do you have kind of a large question, but what do you see the future of cooking in the restaurant industry at this point? You know, what's that like? And, you know, you're kind of in the center of it. So, well, in some ways, yeah, I w- in some ways I, I would actually start with a disclaimer, which isn't I'm not going to dodge the ball, but, um, I don't work in the restaurant industry, Yeah, you know, so I, I, it's, it's an anomaly to me really, you know, I have friends that are restaurant owners or investors or work on the line. Um, I'm, I'm a patron more than anything. So I recognize I, I eat out maybe once every two months, just simply by attraction. Um, I don't know what the future is for the restaurant industry other than, you know, witnessing more and more chefs that I pay attention to globally and that I'm interested in watching. They're starting farms, they're foraging, they're hunting, they're incorporating a more liberated and you, yeah, like we'll mode a building menu first. Yeah. What do I have in stock? Yeah. Okay, this is grown here. This is harvested here. Cool. We're going to use it fresh. And then it'll show up again six months later, but it's going to have been fermented, cured, and there'll be a wine or something, mm. you know? Yeah. So that's that's where I'm attracted as a earth walker, right? Like the at home. Chef, yes, I own it. So I, I'm biased because I have a background in thinking about food. Yeah. But so I can't help but see that. I see it in other restaurants. I, and yet I think I live in a bubble. You know, I, I, I know I live in a bubble. I'm just, I'm not certain exi- what the industry is going to do at large. So I can only speak briefly to what I, I hope I see is, um, you know, working with Pro Start. I was looking at this group and our judging criteria. So I'm just not swinging the needle, but I, I want to like add reflection that restaurants, powered by humans, powered by plants and animals in sort of orchestration. And at some point, those players can get tired of banging on the tuba. Lungs are going to get tired and someone's going to pick up that horn. Yeah. So that's our next generation of cooks and waiters and sommiers and maitres and also admins, accountants, the entire ecosystem. Front of the house, back of the house, the whole set. A, yeah. re- a restaurant is an entire like yep. commerce engine. It's an entire community, right? From all aspects, mm-hmm. all cultures. It's just a wash. And so, what I what I hope, you know, I just see a really broken system. I, I consistently see buy low, sell high, or buy low and then sell it. Like any kind of margin that you can scrape by on, and yet the hospitality industry is like seems very crunched by that margin. There's not a lot to go around. Yeah. And so my hope is that if more home cooks start putting their dollars where they decide to into their diets, into their local economics, um, through decision, you know, I think that that will have to influence restaurants. And then maybe if the consumer category can lift that market, maybe restaurants will have the opportunity to buy better ingredients and raise their prices because consumers are going to expect, well, I'm going to have to pay for I mean, this is the most important thing to my day beyond water. And if someone tried taking water from me, I'd pay everything I had for it. Yeah. So we, we, restaurants, I think it's it's just, it's an interesting scenario where you're, you're paying for something that is delivered by someone else's value system to yours but if you know anything about restaurants, I mean, it's like you got just so much struggle laced into that. Mm. So if you felt everyone's heartbeat in the kitchen, 
if, like if you were able to eat that emotional complex, you'd probably stop eating. Yeah. There. Yeah. As most restaurants are now. Yeah. Broken, hurting. Yeah. Riddled with addiction, yeah. and you know, and I, all due respect, anyone in the restaurant industry listening to this. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying that's how it is blanket statement, but my witness of anyone working in hospitality. So maybe we just raise it to like hospitality. Yeah. It's, it, you know, we're just simply, it just seems like we're trying to like feed an addiction. Hot, sweet, sp- salty, now, over the top. No relation. It's just sort of like, so it's, you know, I'd, I'd love to see the system get more complex and I'd love to see the consumer be far more decisive about why they're going to eat and pay for that restaurant and support that restaurant at the menu. Yep. Knowing this is the cost of food today. This is the cost of water today. This is the cost of good air today. So, you know, that's, that's, that's where I'm at with food. At yeah. Large. Yeah. And I, you know, just a quick note on that is like, you know, I, I tell people sometimes when you see like a chef's photo, them sitting on the counter or their bar, um, they had to stop, put on a brand new chef's coat and take that photo before the madness of their day or in the middle of the madness of the day. And I've seen it go down. I was in a restaurant and watched it go down and I'm like, he's literally looking at dishwasher didn't show up. This ingredient didn't show up that he ordered. This machine is broken. This is missing. Blah, blah, and the list goes on and on and on before he even just stopped for 10 seconds. Hi, how you doing? I'm chef so-and-so. Cheese. Mm-hmm. Cool. We good? Because I got a whole thing I got to deal with behind me. And he's just a, you know, and that was just a pause in the machine. Yeah, man. That you're talking about. So, like, respect to everyone working in the industry. It's It's a tough industry. And... You know, these last, especially with the pandemic and everything, it's just been wild. So I just wanted to get your mindset on that, and that's that awesome. Yeah, I, I, I'm. It it seems counterintuitive to say, well, I'm gonna go frequent less. Yeah, I'm, I'm going less, but I, you know, I do. But but focused. It, I, I I see us all on the same yeah team. Yeah. You know, and that's why I say I'm far. I think I'm more of an educator with all the due respect and humility to professional educators. Yeah. From a culinary point of view, you know, my work at this point has it's a foray into culture and anthropology, ecology, commerce, economy, like hard economics, and then I distill it down into cuisine and feed you breakfast. Yeah. But I could talk for a long time about the components of breakfast. And little time if I talk to you about flavor. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, I knew there's like a lot of, you know, done a lot of hunting. And is there a, a wild game that you have that's a favorite? Mm. Mm, no, not necessarily. I think everything from the wild sector is pretty fascinating to yeah. me. I mean, after everything I've just passionately shared. Yeah. I think I, you know, I have, uh, I, I still have this deep, there's something inside of me knowing that my dad was one to two generations away from having been 100% off the land. Mm. So my dad is part native Mayan mixed with Spanish blood. We're all humans. We're all earth walkers. But at some point, late 1800s, maybe, a lighthouse keeper from Spain came to the Caribbean. There had been Europeans in the Caribbean since the 1500s, right? And yet as my family origin started there in the Americas, it was a mix of Spanish blood and Mayan indigenous. And as I've come to be more comfortable and attracted to that origin, that's where the smell of black beans and tortillas, especially off a clay pot or a comal, mm. it's calling to my, I miss my dad. I wish my dad was alive, you know? Yeah. And, but it, it is definitely resonant far past my experience with my dad. Yeah. And I know it. Yeah. Because it, 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 you know what you know, you know? Yeah. And and I just know that when I smell those smells, I feel those. I haven't 
I haven't smelled those my whole life. I met my dad at 13. I didn't smell a roasted tortilla prior to then. Mm. Not by hand. Mm -hmm. Not 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 the wetness of a clay pot cooking beans. Like, And so when I smelt those for the first time, it was as if it was just deep inside, you know? And so anyhow, more than anything right now, that's my attraction is trying to, even when we first met, you know, you, you mentioned... Um, your connection to Jap Japanese cuisine as mm -hmm. a part of how you find yourself, yeah. how you know yourself. Yeah. And that's uh, through my mom too. Through your mom. Yeah. So then, I mean, it just goes back, right? Yeah. And I, so I just think that restaurants, I don't know how far back. I just wrote a piece about how in the 16th century French banquet halls, they would make like a chicken pot pie, but it was mm -hmm. bird song pie. And imagine it was baked in a bunt pan. So like a donut. So the center, they would have blind baked a little like lid out of crust and packed that center with live flying birds, brought it to the table. When the diners opened it up, that crust would let the birds escape and they would fly out. Mm. I remember reading about that recipe in cooking school at 18 in one of these old dense classic like Escoffier or, you know, La Russe Gastronomique. And recently when I was thinking about glamorous eating and how long we've been eating for this full, expressive, artistic celebration, I'm like, wow, I've, I mean, I've read this multiple times now, you know, I mean, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. And so more than anything, I, I, I don't have any issue with more and like excessiveness per se. And yet... I kind of feel like my attraction goes from excessiveness into less of the material and more of the, the knowing. Like how can I know in excess versus have something physically in front of me in excess that gets thrown into the trash like um, plastic packaging or extra hoo-ha just for a dinner and then all just like disappears into a trash or something. Yeah. At some point, my enthusiasm has just been so deeply curbed by that. I wanted to strip it down and almost have it nude. And, and you know, you get a raw carrot that's just incredible as is. That's an experience. That's yeah. an absolute ecology yeah. story in the soil, the silica, the medium, everything about it. Especially if you've let it sit and you find it in January and it just got buried and you missed it, but it's still like there and now it's all condensed. And so I, I just think we have a lot of exploration left to do in food or we're going back to it. Yeah. So, and you have a great way of describing that, you know, when you, you talk about an ingredient that, you know, mm. a single ingredient, you're like, this is the process it took. This is what you might taste. You mm. might, you know, this is what I taste. It's crunchy, crispy, soft, whatever it is. You, you always have a way, a good way of presenting that. So it's awesome. Thanks. That's all I got. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to share that somebody out there might not know about you? Anything? Anything I want to share that someone out there might not know about yeah, or me? or everyone that doesn't know, you know? Fun facts. Yeah, I don't know if it's fun, but folks will ask someone's question with a question, but yeah. uh, what would you be if you couldn't be a chef? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a couple that with like eight years ago, my grandma had asked me, she said, uh, and my grandma's 98 right now. And um, Grandma Gloria would have asked me on a phone call, like, she said, I have a question, Eddie. Are, are you, I've been playing Mahjong with the girls, and they all see your stuff out there, and they tell me you're not a chef. <laughs> they say you're a businessman. Are you, are you a chef? And, what, do, what do I say? Mm, and I was like, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but it, it really called me to action to stand and look in the mirror and love and own whatever I am and see. And don't, not that you have to, but, you know, I, not many people put salt in their coffee for a reason. You know, so it's like if you can put salt on yourself, you put sugar on yourself, whatever it is, make sure it's what you want it to be. And so I've leaned into that question. And so if I couldn't chef every day, or if I wasn't called a chef or I wasn't in food, I would do design. Mm. And so I've kind of actually ran with that. And now more than anything, I think I design in the food space more than I, I even cook per se. Yeah. Like if I was going to make you a dish and sit and eat, like I said earlier, 
I would speak more of the designed components in totality of how that meal came to be, and I'd be so hyped. The flavor would come in too. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's like, you know where that bowl came from? And, you know, we, that food would get cold in the conversation about how it even came to the table. Mm. And so that's, that's sort of my second career right now that many probably don't know. You know, what are you doing? You're so busy all the time and just killing it with food. And I think that I try to go lightly to that question, um, especially when I meet it out in the wild. Yeah. Um, and that for the most part, I'm, I'm, I'm really deeply considerate of what's next. And so it's, um, I think we're all in transition, you know? And so I think many don't know that my fascination with food has really much to do with how we're turned on and catalyzed through any industry, through any property and awesome. really through any, but, but through purpose, like awesome. what gets you going. Yeah. Then I have some fun ones before we go. Uh, let's go. It's a, usually a gear question because I like gear, love quality stuff, obviously, or just things that are helpful <laughs> throughout your day. Are there a few tools either in the kitchen or outside the kitchen, outdoors, indoors? Mm. What are some of your favorites that, you know, maybe the folks out there be like, oh, that's Eduardo's favorite. I should probably attain that too. What are things that make your day easier? That kind of thing. Mm. Uh doesn't necessarily make my day easier, but I am a coffee drinker. Yeah. And years ago, uh, I was butchering late with a cattle rancher. And um, it was like 9 p.m. And we knew we had four or five more hours to go. And it was just one of those had to do it. And he's like, well, let's go have a burger. And it was his beef. We had just ground it. He threw a whole jar of habanero stuffed green olives into the mix. So it was just like t- bomber. And now it's 10 o'clock. We've eaten late dinner. I'm going to go back in the kitchen. And he's like, you want coffee? I said, yeah, I want coffee. And he, so he throws these beans into a hand cranker and just starts cranking coffee or grinding beans. We have coffee. To that day, I, I have switched from if I'm like grinding whole beans, but I grind them by hand. Yeah. And so this may not change your life like it's changed my yeah. life. But it, um, like a molcajete, a mortar and pestle. Mm-hmm. So to grind my black pepper, I think it's kind of interesting that I don't own a pepper mill. And most chefs just have a pepper mill right there. Yeah. You know, and it's even as an amputee, it kind of even became harder to hold a pepper mill. Yeah. And so grinding peppercorns in a molcajete, feeling those peppercorns pop, knowing I'm putting that energy into it, super enjoyable. Mm. You know, yeah. so that's a, you know, just like a, a little thing that um, you don't need to have a mortal impressor in your life, but it, it, you know, if you're working in food, you're working in the alchemical. Yeah. And there's something about that picture of Merlin with the big cap yeah. stirring the big pot. Yeah. And so it would just, you know, what it's less of a singular item that I'm giving you and it's more of an action. Yeah. Which is to work with your hands with food. Yeah. Make it tactile. You can use the bottom of a pan to pop those peppercorns. You can use a rock. I learned that way, you know. 100%. That was a cool one. Tuck, 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 yeah, tuck, tuck, yeah. I showed actually someone the other day about how to do that. Was, yeah. uh, he was like, "We don't have." I was like, "You know what? You got a saute pan? It's right there." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Oh man, this is cool." You know. So sometimes it, it isn't. A, it's what's on hand. It's, right? it's it's what you have. But yeah. then I'm going to take it the opposite way to full manufacturing and sure. full uh, yeah. package good and and products. But yeah, uh, optics. Mm-hmm. You know, binoculars. Yeah. Being able to observe nature acutely, closely, has definitely changed my life for the better. Um, it's a benefit, a technological benefit that you know is fairly harmless in my opinion. Yeah. And yet to observe a bird preening itself in detail is fascinating. Yeah. And I think observing nature through that magnification has brought back that childlike awe and love and interest in the outdoor world Mm -hmm. and maybe it's because when you're a kid you're just on your hands and knees and you're right there in it but um yeah so anyway optics good optics yeah they're just it's there's a lot of good brands out there yeah 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 awesome and you know that's kind of closing out but i'll leave you the floor the floor is yours um we you can give any advice and also Mm -hmm. tell us what's next for you what's going on uh projects coming up 
Um, you know, obviously you're doing a lot of virtual classes. I think you're, you've been promoting that your team has been promoting that trying to do it maybe quarterly even, or even, even more than that. Sure. And then, you know, tell us what else is going on. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dave, for having me and extending this community out to me. And I appreciate anyone that joined and listened to this session. Um, I've wanted since I watched you start this podcast, I was like, we'll connect one day. I'll throw I'll throw these on one day. And so we'll look forward to doing this again when the yeah, time is right. For sure. You know, next up for me in in the sense that anyone wanting to engage and stay connected and be a part of this whole life journey with me uh, and or together is um, full ownership is like my first step right now. It's just sort of what makes me happy, what makes me sing, and where do I think I find reciprocal value? How am I contributing well? So I'm, I'm just incredibly thoughtful in that right now. Um, working on a cookbook, it's going to take 24 months to actually occur and come out to life. But I actually just signed that contract last night. So that's a pretty big deal for me. Awesome. Yep. Congrats. Thank you. And uh, where our, you know, I pinch myself, but James Beard award winning, double Emmy nominated show Big Sky Kitchen on the Magnolia Network. I mean, that was a 13 year dream to have a cooking show on major television. And knowing that won't renew for a third season, I realized I don't necessarily need to be television. Now having done it, is that the goal? If I distill it down, the goal is not to necessarily have a television show on a network, but rather to connect with all of you. Yeah. And so the, the most immediate way I can do that and what's coming up next is to collaborate with all of you and say, all right, you know, we're opening up this kitchen as a live streamed every other month. So we're doing five this year. Okay. And my goal is to continue in that same aspect of Big Sky Kitchen. So it's, it's sort of a non-scripted but thoughtful um, direct from me to you live. There'll be 18 people. Switchboards, this whole table will be full. Yep. And yet it's sort of... The beauty of it is it's non-censored. It's just there's no ad sales. It's, you know, we have partners, Mystery Ranch, Benchmade Knives, Benefits Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, which is our access to public land and water, uh, Durant Oil out of Oregon. So some of these partners we've worked with over years are contributing their equity to say, no, we want to see this conversation and food happen. We want to be a part of it. And that is incredibly catalyzing to me and stimulating. And so we're leaning into that and bringing on other partnerships that want to be a part of a food equity story. And it starts with just this. It's a conversation. And yet I'll be cooking and hopefully you'll get the ingredients. I mean, you, you joined a gnocchi class and a tamale class you've been at. Well, I've, the gnocchi and one's coming. That, the but. gnocchi one's actually coming up. It hasn't happened yet. Oh, that's that's and right. That's coming up on March 19th. This podcast will probably come out after that class. So that's you right. guys might have missed it. Um, but I've done the tamale class. We met over it face to face, literally over the crepe class for Mother's Day. Yeah. Um, and then I've done at least three, uh, at least two others. Yeah. But to give kind of the consumer side is like, yeah. So you just go online, like, you know, when. Eduardo posted or the team posted at Montana Mex, you know, they're all on Instagram, wherever you get your socials, you can just go online to Montana Mex. Usually what's cool about it. And I love the way when companies or chefs do this is they put together a little kit Mm -hmm. and it's ingredients that you're going to use for the class. So you order them usually two, three weeks in advance so it can get shipped to you on time. And then, um, you know, this last one was a tamale. So you got, you know, Masienda flour. You had the wood. What's the wood company that? Uh, Out of Montana, early yeah, wood. Early wood. And, and um, a spreader. Yep. And then you had your ingredients in there. And uh, I think there was a tea towel <laughs> and maybe a couple other things, I think, in there. And so having that kit, you're like ready. You have the flour. Mm-hmm. You can make a tamale. So, and then you provide a recipe. You know. Yeah, well, and, and the point of it is, is to say, it, in that sense, it's saying, well, this is an heirloom flower. It's one of the best ground corn flowers mm-hmm. I've found. Now, by extension, I can share this with you. Now, that's, yeah. that's commerce happening, right? Yeah. And so, whereas we talked about this earlier over breakfast and all these aspirations and ideas that we may want to accomplish in our life, and I realized that actually through collaboration, and that's where consumerism, I think, you know, con- has sort of a conscious element, is saying, no, no, I'm going to offer this best-in-class product that I believe has an equitable chain throughout its whole journey. So now by extending it out to you to learn this 
value added skill, making tortillas, making tamales, whatever it is. Now I've connected that value to everybody. And I'm now a beneficiary just like you are. You know, that is the equality of these classes is it just opens the footprint to say, I believe everyone would benefit by learning how to make an emulsion. So we're going to do a class where we're going to emulsify a couple things. Keep going. Okay. I think there's an opportunity where to make gnocchi. Okay. I think there's a method here. There's a valuable asset here. We're going to talk about nutrition and we're going to talk about story and an hour and a half will go by like this. And now before you know it, it's like, uh, watch once, learn once, or watch once, do once, teach once. And so my hope is that folks join, are stimulated, catalyzed, and then when the channel turns off, you're now live in your life, reciprocated doing this, bringing it to someone else, and it adds on to your life through experience, just yeah. like, yeah. you know, it, so it's, it should be, the word entertaining sounds so foreign to even say, I, I'm not here to say it's going to be entertaining, yeah, But when I think of education, that's what's brought me the most joy in life is to know that someone invested in me learning more about like the boundlessness of this world. Yeah. That's always what I wanted. Yeah. So I just get to extend what I feel like the most vitality in out to you all, which is breaking bread, learning and having a conversation. So I hope to see you in that kitchen. Yeah, for sure. And uh, lastly, leave some advice, whatever you want to say. Floor is yours. Oh, man, I would say I'm going to do it different for this actual session than than others. Uh, take a take a minute, take a uh, take longer to hold some space for an elder, you know, or, or 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 someone that's younger. And so that has added on to my life in in in, in innumerable ways. And I think that there's potential to find wisdom in an ego-free place where, mo you know, leaving this world, some people give up that fight of ego and you can just get so much for just making time for someone that um, I think has everything to give at that point. And then spending time with the youth is equally stimulating. So encouraging folks to really lean into this younger generation and how to give them the most objective ability to make the mistakes and get experienced by their account. And it takes a lot of humility to do it and make time for anything outside of what you want. And so I'm saying this as my advice too, right? Like this is what I'll like leave because this is what I'm feeling and I feel like I need to hear too right now. So on that note, thank you everybody. Appreciate you guys. Eduardo. Yeah, man. Honored. Thank Thanks, you. Dave. Yep. Take care. Bye. And as a quick reminder, the restaurants and gear talked about on each episode can be found on my website, foodoriginspodcast.com. I appreciate your support and thanks for listening.